All right, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Stephen Mercer, and I'm an expert college admission counselor, and I guide students through a once in a lifetime rite of passage to find a great college for them. I also help train college counselors in the UC San Diego College Counseling Certificate Program. And I'm really excited to be with uh, someone who's an expert in a field that is a really, really important one to understand if you're a student athlete. I'm here with Katie Anderson with College Fit, which is a practice that she has in California, where she is an expert in helping students who want to play sports in college navigate a pretty complex process of making sure they can find their great options to play in college. Uh, and there's been a lot of changes recently because of the pandemic, which if you've been watching uh, our recent episodes, you know that that's something that we've been talking a lot about. So Katie, welcome. Thanks for making time to be here with us today. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. So Katie, you know, could you start by just telling us a little bit about how did you develop this expertise? It's a pretty specific one, and I'm sure there's a really cool story behind it about your own experiences. Absolutely. So I, I grew up in Southern California, and I told my parents that I did not want to go to college anywhere in the Western United States. My, my parents were, my dad especially, was a little disappointed since he played basketball and baseball at USC. But I, um, I worked with a college counselor. Um, my, my family hired a college counselor for me, and I wanted to play either volleyball or soccer in college. So I did everything that I currently recommend students do by preparing a, a recruiting video, writing to college coaches, trying to find those schools that were the best fit for me athletically and academically. And as it turned out, Duke University was starting a women's soccer team that year. And uh, so it turns out that I got recruited to play soccer and I was on the very first women's team at Duke. So that sort of um, prompted me when I started my business um, to help student to help students find their way through the college admissions process to specialize in athletics. Um, in my area, there were a number of people who did have athletic practices where they just helped athletes alone. They didn't do the academic piece. So I decided to combine my practice and do both, um, which has, has been great for many of my students who kind of go along that path. And many of them get recruited, but I've got a few that also decide to just become regular students. And, uh, and that's fine, too. Yeah. And you also help counselors, college counselors all around who don't have that expertise to, to try to understand how they can help their students no matter where they're at, right? Correct. Yes. I have a co-counseling program where any um, academic uh, college advisor can work together with me and I supply just the athletic recruiting piece and they can continue working with their families um, and we work together in a partnership. So, um, right. and, and that's really picked up since the pandemic hit, that part has really helped. And I find that a lot of college counselors who don't have this expertise would rather do that than try to, um, try to gain that, uh, that specialization all on their own. So that's been yeah. wonderful for many families across the U S and some international as well. Excellent. Well, I've certainly learned over the years that there's just a lot to know about the athletic recruitment process. And it is a real area that requires pretty solid expertise and real precise steps. And there can be a lot of missteps, right? The biggest one would just be getting started on time, getting started early. Mm -hmm. And this year, I really feel that many families have started to understand that. Um, you know, the pandemic has put everybody in panic mode. <laughs> so um, that part's been, been great. Okay. Families are contacting me much earlier than they normally have. Good. So let's talk about the pandemic and how that's impacted this, this process of the journey from typically high school, I guess, it doesn't have to be, but to college and to play on a team, right, in a, in a sport that, that students love. Um, I, I'm guessing that the pandemic has really, like a lot of things, has really um, changed things, uh, maybe permanently, maybe temporarily. I definitely want to hear your thoughts, but can you start by telling us what you think this has done specifically for high school students who are looking to play in college, um, you know, what, what are the big impacts that the pandemic has made? Well, I would say first off, athletes, you know, overnight had their athletic competitions and teams shut down. So whether they were playing their sport in high school or whether they were doing it in high school and in on a club team, which, you know, many of my athletes who are trying to get recruited are, are playing both, um, 
that overnight got shut down and that caused a number of issues. Um, one is they just weren't getting the training. Um, they weren't getting the exercise and the, that mm -hmm. physical fitness piece to what it is that they do. Um, they, because of that lack of training and because of the lack of games uh, that were then shut down and competitions that kids would typically um, attend, especially in the summertime, sometimes spring break, sometimes over, over the holidays when kids would attend um, showcase tournaments and ID camps and all those sort of things, that all got shut down. That Those are tools that are not only great for the student athletes, but they are primary recruiting tools for coaches. So um, right. so all of those things, you know, kind of fed into this, well, what do we do now? If I can't play, I can't get video. If I can't have video, I can't contact coaches. Um, it's sort of, that became this rolling train of, <laughs> oh my gosh, what do I do next? So the recruiting video thing has been interesting. And I would say in addition to the recruiting video also, for time-based sports like swimming and track and cross country where getting better and better times is really your only proof of your improvement. Um, you can videotape all day long, but that doesn't tell a college coach whether you've, you know, if you're doing any better. So um, right. what we're seeing now though, is after a year of this, many of my student athletes have in fact been able to continue training one way or another, even if it's on their own or if it's in small groups, um, you know, as things have started to ease up a little bit in the past few months, co teams are back practicing again. And I can see um, that camps are starting to come back on uh, the, the radar again. Um, many summer camps are, are definitely showing up on, on um, college websites that were canceled last summer. Um, showcase tournaments, families are now making flight plans and travel plans to drive to, you know, another state to be able to attend those tournaments. And, and so that's key. When you, if, if you're a student athlete in that situation, make sure that every opportunity you have to, to gain video out of those opportunities is going to be huge. Because again, mm -hmm. if a college coach still can't see you play in person, that recruiting video might be the only thing they see which could be a, a factor in, you know, in having a next discussion and wanting to recruit you. So make sure that, you know, many of those events are, I'm hearing from all my, my kids are being live streamed. So um, mm. the good news is they're being videotaped one way or another, whether it's by a parent or by um, some other organization. So try to get as much okay. of that video as you can get it out, you know, as soon as you have it and you can clip it and do, you know, make it into a highlight film, make sure you're proactively sending that out to coaches, especially juniors right now. Um, you know, we've all been caught the seniors, hopefully by now it's, it's, uh, a, a point in time in the spring when many seniors will have kind of solidified their options, but for you juniors, make sure that, you know, and any, really any junior in any year that you're listening to this, uh, you know, you juniors in the spring, this is the time to be um, making sure that you're kind of getting those those final rounds of your spring competitions out to college coaches if they're still trying to decide who they want. And I would also say that another area that's been impacted heavily has just been that communication element between coaches and student athletes because the NCAA put in place a dead period. Um, that dead period was for Division One schools, and that stopped the face-to-face on-campus or off-campus recruiting of student athletes. It did not, mm. however, stop coaches, as long as the student was old enough, meaning that they were beyond um, their sophomore, you know, beyond uh, June 15th of their uh, end of their sophomore year, as long as they were old enough, the coach could still email them or call them or have a Zoom call, but they couldn't meet with them on or off campus in any face-to-face -face contact. Um, inc that includes doing unofficial or official visits, which is a key <laughs> part of this whole uh, process for student athletes deciding where, which programs are the best fit for them. So um, those rules just recently got, uh, we heard from the NCAA that May uh, 31st will be the last day of the, of this sort of COVID dead period for division one. So that's great news because it means for, again, for juniors uh, that that will be that will be lifted and all of, things will start to return to normal as long as we continue on the path that we're on, you know, so far. 
Now, some sports, you know, sports have a dead period that is part of their recruiting cycle, but this was not that, that this was COVID and okay. keeping it fair for everyone. And I think you, you raised a really important um, distinction that I think it's important for uh, potential student athletes to know about in that depending on the sport, the role that actual play that you're doing in high school as you move through the years, getting to that point when you're going to get recruited, hopefully, the role that that plays in the recruitment process is really, really important, but it also varies depending on the sport, right? And I think that was really something very interesting you said. I'm curious then, when you said play had come to a halt and the ability to create video that you could share with coaches kind of really came to a halt um, and maybe is starting to come back a little bit. But what about those sports where video or the the actual play is not as important, like something like swimming, right? You mentioned is it's about the times that you're getting in competition, right? Correct. So is it a similar issue or is there, is that compounded or, you know, where's that? Right. So I have told kids that if you're a swimmer or a runner and your times are the only way to prove to a coach, um, you know, how fast you are, um, you know, some kids were lucky enough that their times were already very good. So sharing maybe sophomore year times with a college coach was going to get them at least noticed and on their radars to say, you know, when I when things return to normal, I, I'll send you updated times. Um, in other cases, you know, kids grow. <laughs> Kids in high school grow, especially boys. Uh, many of them by their junior and senior year, they're still growing. The girls, however, have kind of stopped growing. And so many, you know, college coaches know this and they know that you're you're kind of waiting around for that junior and senior year to roll around because you can see great time drops and, you know, time improvements with those sports. So I was, you know, kind of advising kids, look, during this pandemic, when you can't get those official times, even if you can do, um, you know, if you're at practice and you're running time trials, feel free to say, there's no harm in sending that information to a coach. If you're, if you're showing regular improvement through time trials and your coach can verify that, you know, he was there, it's all unofficial anyway, but it's still, it's, it's going to be something rather than nothing. Okay. Don't wait, don't feel that you can't, you know, that you're strapped by that. So now that okay. things are, are coming back, um, I, I'm seeing that a lot of my kids are getting times down, um, especially for track where kids, a lot of kids don't run club. They really just run for their high school. Um, I really have advised kids to try to find a local club track program. Um, that has mm -hmm. been huge because they could find ways to compete um, where the high schools were a little bit more under the pressure of whatever the district was telling them they had to do. So, okay. Now standardized testing, which we've talked about in other episodes before has also been disrupted in a very significant way and has had lots of people worried about college admission and, you know, we'll see where that all goes, but that plays a pretty important role in the athletic recruitment process as well. Right? Absolutely. The NCAA yeah. has an eligibility center and the eligibility center is really meant to um, evaluate kids' academic eligibility to be able to play in college. They have to meet minimum standards for Division I and Division II schools. For both of those um, processes, they need to, the SAT and ACT is part of that evaluation process. And the NCAA just recently came out with an announcement in the last uh, week or two where they basically said, we are going to issue one more waiver for kids who would be starting college in the fall of 2022. Um, so that the the eligibility process will be test optional. They will not be required to submit test scores. Now, something that, that's really important in that mix is that the eligibility process is not the same as the admissions process. So good news, if you are not able to get a test score, if your test keeps getting canceled, as an athlete and you're a, a junior right now, you don't have to you know, necessarily stress out about getting this. However, if the college you're applying to is saying that you need to submit a test score, or if it really would help with um, say some additional scholarship money, if you're looking for that merit award, then you're going to be back in the testing world again, because, you know, the, the I think you have to remember to look at this from many different angles and not just, well, the eligibility center doesn't need it. So now I don't need to do it. That is not necessarily true. So can we switch gears a little bit and talk about how this has impacted 
what's going on in colleges and the recruitment efforts. Uh, how have colleges been impacted? How have their programs been impacted? Um, what are the roadblocks, et cetera? And are things getting better or are they getting worse? It's, you know, where, what's your take on all of this? So colleges have absolutely been impacted by this whole process. You saw that in the, in the fall with football and um, in the winter with basketball, that everyone was desperate for their, <laughs> for their sports. But knowing something you have to recognize is that football and basketball on the, from the college perspective are two critical sports that are money makers for every school. And if they can't have a season, it does not only just impact their own sports, it impacts their entire athletic budgets. So this is this was really, really important for, for schools to be able to try their best to do what they could to have a, um, even at the, the lowest basic level, have some sort of season um, because it's a money-making um, issue for them. Um, not many other sports actually bring in funds to the athletic department. Um, oftentimes, all of those other sports are actually utilizing that money. So um, when it came to how, you know, how this has impacted them, um, well, first of all, we know that the, the coaches were not, you know, we've already talked about the fact that the, the communication with their, the, kid, the kids that they were trying to recruit was hampered. In, in many ways, it forced coaches into decision-making mode that really got pushed off. Um, that decision-making, where, where they would prefer to make their decisions, like the summertime between a student's junior and senior year, in some cases, they were having to you know push that off until the spring even. I had cross-country runners where the coach said, I need to see times from you before I'm going to commit to having you on my team. Mm -hmm. Well, my mm -hmm. kids weren't getting times until just now. <laughs> Right. So, so um, just know that coaches um, who are are absolutely being impacted by this, and they're having to make decisions not the way that they normally do, and sometimes they're committing kids that they've only seen play on video and they've never actually seen them play in person, which is not a happy place for for some coaches. Um, but still, it it puts everybody in a in a difficult situation. Um, okay. The other piece of this that's really heavily been impacted are budgets um, when right. it comes to. Okay, so we know that the money is not coming in from basketball and football. How do those other sports adjust? Well, there's a couple of different ways that they adjust. One is to reduce, They've many of them were forced to reduce, you know, if they had a season, they were reduced to only going places, competing against teams that they could drive to and weren't in another state. <laughs> so where their normal competition might be located in a region of the United States, it's now being very limited to some local schools that they could, you know, that neither team had to drive very far to to get to that school, right? To keep things kind of close by. Um, another another thing that could be impacted. So your travel budget's been impacted, and the number of players you might take with you on a, a travel event um, would also be hampered. So. Um, Hopefully, those sorts of things will start to resolve themselves as next season rolls around and we can get back to a little more normalcy, although there are no guarantees in any of this. You know, we still may be seeing a year of kind of modified uh, everything. Um, but then the, the other big, huge one is the number of schools that have had to drop programs completely. Mm -hmm. um, we all, yeah. uh, you know, if you're paying attention to Stanford when they made their announcement, um, they, they, they dropped their men's and women's fencing, their field hockey, lightweight rowing, um, men's rowing, co-ed and um, women's sailing, squash, synchronized swimming, men's volleyball, mm -hmm. and wrestling. <laughs> when you say dropped, we're not talking pandemic, holding they'll get back to it. You're talking about they Stanford University has completely done away with those programs you just mentioned. Yes, it says right here on my on my notes, uh they will all be discontinued after the 2021 school year. So Okay. Those are all programs and, that are not money makers for the school. <laughs> that's a shame. Yes. Gosh. You know, it's it's just kind of shocking to me that um you know, a prominent uh well-regarded institution um that's not a small school either uh took that step now is this rare is this happening elsewhere what's what's happening this is happening all over the place um it mm. uh, stanford is a is a pretty big one um but if you look at it sport by sport you'll see that certain sports have been hit much harder than others um tennis and golf 
cross country and swimming have all been hit kind of the hardest. Um, mm. Tennis, uh, the latest numbers I had were something like 49 programs across the country got dropped. Um, mm. Now, there are a lot of tennis programs out there and golf as well, right? There's still lots and lots of opportunity. I'm not indicating that all of a sudden it's not an option anymore. It's just that these are some sports that have, you know, they have to maintain their facilities. <laughs> they have to maintain their teams. They're not bringing in money for the, the schools. And, you know, in some cases, it's a in some cases, it might be a balance of Title IX requirements, um, you know, that they have to maintain that balance of the men's and women's programs or, you know, there's, there's various reasons why they may have chosen okay. to do that. My hope is that in the next few years, maybe schools will be able to recover a little bit and maybe some of we'll see some of that coming back, but you never okay. know. It could have, they, those programs could have already been in trouble for a while and schools were sort of holding on. Uh, and then this was the thing that kind of pushed it over the edge. So. Okay. That's interesting to see where that's going to go. And so your advice for a swimmer or a golfer who's hearing this and they say, Oh no, I really, uh, I'm in trouble. You're I'm going to guess your advice is, that there are a lot of still a lot of programs even within those sports and that there's a strategy and there's a way to cast a nice wide net am i getting that wrong or what what would your advice be to those athletes right absolutely they've got to cast a wide net um many times if you're you know, the nice thing about time based sports is you can zero in pretty reliably on programs where you would be a reasonable fit for a um for a for a, a particular swim program, um, you know, certain sports have rankings and and time uh, or distance based numbers that really give you a good indication. Um, oftentimes, it's not always about those time based numbers. It might be for, if you take swimming for example, if you are at the top of the swimming list, you know, any swimmer or any runner who can compete in multiple sports and be of mm. even more benefit to a team because they can score points for in a competition in multiple in multiple sports and be on a relay team. Um, those are opportunities where a student athlete might be able to get some nice scholarship money. If you're at the mm. bottom end of a school's time range for a particular event, you're more, maybe the, the coach is able to help you in admissions, or maybe you're just a walk on. Um, so you have to kind of think about when you're, when you're targeting schools and you're trying to figure out where am I going to get, uh, if you're looking for money, you have to th take into account that that that's a, those are easy ways. Those are easy um, sports to be able to kind of tar zero in on exactly where you might be have the best potential for getting some scholarship money. Or if you're just trying to, if it's just an admissions thing, if you're just trying to get help in admissions, that's helpful. It's harder to do in kind of team-based sports, but right, yeah. Okay. So, you know, my, my kind of my final question is, is really building off of that, what you just mentioned. And that's, you know, for a student athlete who's listening, a high school student, let's say, or a family that's thinking about this. I often hear students in my work with them early in high school, they're, they're, they're an athlete in high school, they enjoy it. They're probably pretty good at it. They've devoted a lot of time and energy to it and they want to keep doing it. And the prospect of playing in college in some way, not necessarily division one, even division two or three, all sounds really exciting to them. And yet I too often come across students who have this pretty vague idea that Yep, that's something I'll, I'd like to do. And I, th I know I'm supposed to talk to some coaches and that's about all they've got. And they don't know where they are. They don't know where they are, they, whether it's, it's a time-based type of recruitment process and how to gauge where their times are, or if it's a, a, a type of sport, as you mentioned, that's a different category. It's not necessarily time-based. Maybe it's a team sport. And just taking their initial measure of Am I competitive as an athlete for division one, two, or three, whether or not they want to go down that path, but just a realistic picture of should they even go down the path and how they might do that? What's your advice to students who are thinking about those things? Because those are important questions to get answered at the beginning, I think. 
Absolutely. There, and those are really big questions. Um, I, mm. That's exactly where many of my students start when I, when I meet with them. So we do an initial meeting where we kind of talk through many of the details around, okay, let's talk about what kind of student you are. Let's talk about what kind of athlete you are, who, which teams are you playing for? How tall are you? What do you weigh? Some of those, you know, if you have any other uh, sports-based statistics, um, depending on your sport, those are all important details. Um, it's classic that I will get a football player who, you know, is got, you know, everybody's got the big football dream and trying to help that student athlete find the right fit. And when they realize that a lineman at a big school that they've, you know, been watching on TV every, <laughs> every weekend for their whole lives is twice as big as they are, <laughs> that dream has to be adjusted. And I try to tell them like, look, you know, having an open mind is the best thing you can do for yourself in this process. If you really wanna play your sport, I guarantee you there's a place out there where you can do it. It just might not look like your, your, your dream. So having an open mind about location, about the types of schools you're going after and keeping, I think also a really open mind about what the financial impact is for your family if you can go to a school where you're where you're getting a, a nice scholarship that could really have a huge impact on how much money you're going to owe at the end of four or maybe five years of college um but it's not your dream school kids oftentimes that's where they 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 come to you know weighing those those options um it's important yeah. that they're proactive it's important that they put together an a student athlete profile that they write an email that they collect their video and then we you know prepare a list of colleges that that I think are a good starting point for contacting coaches and then see what kind of response we get back if we don't get much of a response, that's an indicator that we're not looking in the right place and we need to adjust that list. And okay. so all of that, that what, how things roll out over time tends to give a student athlete a little bit of ver kind of that validation of, am I, am I doing the right thing here or do I need to adjust my expectations? Um, and as long as, you okay. know, you have, uh, again, an open mind about things and, and then hopefully we can can help zero in on those opportunities. But it does, it's a process and it is very much separate from the college admissions process. So there's a, I often find that I have kids doing both, creating a, their athletic recruiting list and their wish list of schools where they're going to apply as a regular student. And I tell them all they have to have a plan B and the, an right. academic only plan B. Um, because if you get injured, something happens, the coach leaves, you know, you've, You've got to Sorry. have your own insurance policy for how you are going to move th forward in your life and not leave that in the hands of a coach. Um, okay. Really important. Yeah, really great advice. I think you said something there that's really sticks with me is that the college admission process in the quote traditional way, right? The academics and the essays, all of that is a separate journey. It's parallel perhaps, but it's separate from the athletic recruiting process. And if a student or family wants to embark on that, they have to embark on those two journeys together. They cross over at certain times, but they have to treat them as separate processes. And that's a really good piece of advice. I've seen that play out too. Yes, it, it's very, uh, they, I find that sometimes students will come to their senior year in the fall. And if things aren't going the way they want with athletic recruiting, then we just switch over to, okay, you're going to put in some applications. And in okay. fact, if you want to revisit the athletic recruiting, once you've been admitted to a school, you can still contact the coach and say, coach, I got in your school. Now I'm trying to decide where I want to go. Um, do you still have opportunities or when are your tryouts? You know, how, did you even notice me the first time around? Maybe there's still a, a roster spot on your team. So, um, you know, I, I feel like there's a, there's always opportunity as long as you're willing to um, to take it and, and move forward with it. But it, it takes being proactive. Absolutely. Great. Great advice. Katie Anderson, thank you so much. Your experience and your um, understanding of this really, really detailed and important process is really wonderful to hear and really grateful for you spending some time with us today. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you invited me.